Uh, we're going to move on to chapter 15 here. Chapter 15 is all about aromatic compounds. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're going to sort of finally introduce a compound that you've seen uh, quite a while. It's kind of associated with organic chemistry, but we've never gone over it. And that is the six-membered ring where every other bond is a double bond. This is benzene. Very famous organic molecule here, okay? Um, this is going to be a chapter that really revolves around these benzene rings as well as these benzene derivatives, all right? Uh, the very first thing that we're going to do is go over nomenclature of benzene and benzene derivatives. Okay? All right, so step one, we're gonna find our parent chain, and that parent chain is going to be that benzene ring. All right, so let's just put an example here. Our parent chain is benzene. Then we're going to find and name our substituents. I got this three carbon group right here, this three carbon alkyl group. So what would that be called? Propyl group, okay? Step three would be to number your parent chain. And then at the end, we put it all together, we assemble the name, okay? In this case here though, I don't have to actually include the locant. This would just be propyl benzene. My substituent name, the propyl group, my parent chain, the benzene ring. Why don't I have to put the one out in front? It's the only one, like the only possibility. If I move the propyl group to the other side of the ring, all I'm gonna do is change what I number as carbon one, right? So there's only one choice. So we can just note for number the parent chain, for what we would call mono-substituted rings, rings with only one function, or one substitution on there. We don't have to worry about our numbering scheme. All right, so let's just do some examples real quick. Sorry.
All right, so again, in all of these, my parent chain is gonna be that benzene ring. Uh, we have this chlorine right here. What do we call that? Chloro. Chloro. Remember, our uh, halogens we treat just like alkyl groups, right? There's nothing special about those particular functional groups. They always just go out front of the name. In this case, I again have a mono substituted benzene ring, so this would just be chlorobenzene. Now I have an alkyl group, this time a four carbon al alkyl group, so this is a butyl group, so this would be butyl benzene. And then in my last example, I have these two one carbon groups. So these are both methyl groups. I have one two carbon group. So that would be an ethyl group. And since it's benzene, I don't have to worry about the numbers, right? No, in this case I do because there's not just one substituent. There's multiple, so I have to indicate how far they are, right? Those methyl groups could be right next to each other. They could be on opposite sides of the ring. So in this case, we do need to put in our numbering. Remember, one of the things that makes rings tricky is there's no like clockwise or counterclockwise rule. The rule is we want the smallest possible number in our name, right? So in this case, it actually, since they're both methyl groups, wouldn't really matter. One will be on carbon one, one on carbon three, and then the ethyl group on carbon two. Importantly, when I assemble the name, same rules as always, I'm going to put those substituents in alphabetical order. So 2-ethyl-1-3-dimethyl-benzene. All right. So... Uh, there's another functional group that I want to introduce you to. It kind of falls into the same category as the halogens in that there's nothing really special about it. We treat it like a substituent, but it's going to be really important for this particular chapter. And that is this NO2. This is what we call a nitro group. So this one right here would be nitrobenzene. There's no fancy consideration about the nitro group and prioritizing and anything like that. It goes at the beginning of the name. But this functional group is going to come up a lot in the next two chapters. All right. You'll see it abbreviated NO2, but let's be good and draw out our full Lewis structure here as well. See how those nitrogens and the oxygens are connected. All right, importantly, how you'll have to do it on your homework. Okay, it turns out that that nitrogen is single bonded to one oxygen and double bonded to the other. I want you to fill in any missing lone pairs and formal charges here. How many lone pairs am I putting on this oxygen? Two. Two. That's a normal happy oxygen with a formal charge of zero. What about this oxygen with a, just a single bond? Three. Now that needs three. And what's my formal charge? Zero. Minus. And what about my nitrogen? How many lone pairs? Zero. None, right? Because it's already got its four bonds. So then what would the formal charge be? Positive. So note that in this functional group, we have both a positively charged nitrogen and a negatively charged oxygen, which is why when we write the shorthand, we don't write any formal charge on it, right? Because those will cancel each other out, okay? And you can see that just like a carboxylic acid, this negative charge is stabilized through resonance, right? So it bounces back and forth between those two oxygens, okay? Again, a really important functional group. We'll talk about its properties here in a second, but just to make note of the name, 
This is nitrobenzene. Again, that nitro group kind of think about as a halogen. It'll always just go out front of the name. Okay. So, in terms of numbering our parent chain, we said if it was a mono substituted ring, we have no numbering. Okay. We're going to say tri plus. We need our numbering. For di substituted benzenes, we have this special scheme that we're going to use here called the ortho meta para. All right, so let's just take a look here. Again, this is now di substituted benzenes. Okay, so I'm going to look at a benzene ring. I'm going to put two chloral groups on there. <clears throat> so it's a di substituted ring. but I'm gonna space them out differently, okay? So in my first structure, they're right next to each other. My second structure, now they're one carbon removed from one another. And in my last structure, they're going to be on opposite sides of the ring. As long as there's the spacing correctly, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. And we'll talk by the end of today, maybe maybe the beginning of tomorrow, why that spacing is really important. Okay. Okay. So uh, the first one we could call 1,2-dichlorobenzene. The next one, 1,3. One, the next one, 1,4. One, but for whatever reason, just to be a huge pain in the ass, they don't use numbering for di-substituted benzenes. They have this ortho-meta-para designation, okay? So ortho is when they are right next to one another. So this wouldn't be 1,2-dichlorobenzene, but ortho, one, uh, no, ortho dichlorobenzene. All right, there is a dash between the ortho and the dichloro. All right. The other thing that you'll see is, and I'll accept either, is just O dichloro benzene. Um, if you see it in the text, it's like an italicized O. That's not going to work for our homework, so just put the O dash. All right, either one of these would be acceptable. One removed from one another. This is the meta dichloro benzene or M dash dichloro benzene. All right, and lastly, when they're on opposite sides of the ring, this is then the para position. Which you can just abbreviate P. All right, and the, these designations tell you how far apart these substituents are from one another. Again, the ortho position means that they're right next door. Meta one removed, para on opposite sides of the ring. All right, so they're telling you how far apart these two uh, substituents are. Okay, so how can we remember the position here? So let's, let's put one thing up at the top here, whatever it is, we'll just leave it as an X. 
Again, right next door, on either side, ortho, then meta, and then para, or in order, O, M, P. Sounded like OMG, say it like a valley girl, OMP, all right? That was terrible, but you know what I'm saying, all right? That is how we're gonna remember it, the ortho right next door, meta one more, para on the opposite side. All right, so let's just, and this is what we're going to use. For any dye substituted benzene ring, we're always gonna default to this ortho meta para system here. Okay, so then let's do some more examples here. I'm gonna put down a few structures and you're gonna name them for me using that system. Uh, they can be. They, well, let's let's graduate to those more complicated examples. We're going to leave them the same for right now. Because I got a whole different level of complication to throw at you here. So now I have these two ethyl groups here. So I got a diethyl benzene here. And which is my ortho meta para designation? These would be meta to one another. So meta diethyl benzene. All right, now I got two bromines. What do we call those substituents? Bromo groups. And when they're on opposite sides of the ring like this, we call them para. So para dibromo benzene. All right, and lastly, we got our new functional group here. What are these NO2s? nitro groups. I think they might even top the bromo group for the coolest sounding name. 
All right, and in this particular example, they are what? Ortho, meta, or para? Ortho. Ortho. So di nitro benzene. All right, and, and just to be clear, I mean, it's pretty natural to put your first functional group on the top and then start moving over, but there's a, this ring is perfectly symmetrical. You can rotate it any which way, right? So there's no difference between my ortho structure where my two nitro groups are on the bottom and if I flip this thing upside down, right? So remember, this is just one of the most perfectly symmetric molecules here. Cool, all right. So pretty straightforward in terms of nomenclature where we have our benzene as our parent chain. Much like when we were talking about cycloalkanes, we don't need to worry about numbering if there's a mono substituted ring, but we do have got to do it if there's any more than that. And now the special little added on bit is specifically for benzene derivatives. We have this ortho meta -pero designation, uh, depending on how far apart those two substituents are. Okay, so these were all using benzene. We're gonna extend this concept to what we call the benzene derivatives. All right, this is what we get when we start tacking functional groups onto our benzene. All right, so let me, let's just do one example and then I'll show you the list. Okay. So now I'm gonna put an OH group on that benzene ring. Which is, which functional group? Alcohol, Alcohol right? So it'd be pretty tempting to think that we would do what we do to other compounds, which is just change the end of the name to all, right? Like benzol or something like that. That is not what the name of this is. These compounds all have their own special little name when you start putting functional groups on a benzene ring, okay? So an alcohol group on a benzene ring, this is phenol. A carboxylic acid on a benzene ring. Actually, this one's pretty normal. This one's benzoic acid. I'm going to stick this carbonyl group off of there. What do we call that? What functional group, rather? You don't know the name. Very close to a ketone, but what do we call it when it's on the very end, such that there's a hydrogen over here? It's the stupidest thing in the world. It should be a ketone, but we got a, new, uh, a different name for it when it's on the very end, an aldehyde. So this is benzaldehyde. checks out. It's got an aldehyde functional group in there. Okay, and the last two, we have this nitrogen on there. What's our functional group? Amine, yep. But this one's got a bizarre name here, kind of like phenol. This is aniline. All right, and lastly, if we have this methyl ether going on, which I just gave away as an ether functional group, <laughs> this one is anisole.
All right, so these are these benzene derivatives. We just got to know these here. Again, we stick these functional groups on. It's got a special name, all right? Uh, benzoic acid, because it's a carboxylic acid, benzaldehyde, that kind of checks out. Phenol at least has that OL ending for an alcohol. Two weird ones are aniline and anisole. How are we going to keep these straight? Well, let's just note here that aniline has the N at the end of the name and anisole has the O at the end of the name. All right, so when we're breaking our tie there. Matches the functional group. Okay, so we have our benzene derivative here. Say it again. Yeah, well, we'll get, that's kind of a different, I want it in a different bucket than these ones. I'll show you why in a second. Okay, so now what are we going to do with this here? Now let's take an example of, for example, a phenol. But I'm going to stick another functional group on there, another substituent. How do we go about naming this compound here? So this list of five benzene derivatives is really important because if any of those functional groups appear in your molecule, this becomes your parent chain, okay? So let's just make note. We said benzenes are parent chain or are benzene derivative. So by sticking that OH group on there, this is no longer the parent chain of benzene, but the parent chain of what? Phenol. Okay. Uh, take a second and see if you can't name this on your own, actually. This isn't, we, we can do this, I promise. And since it's di substituted, what are you going to use? Ortho M O M P, right? Ortho meta para. So this one would be meta fluorophenol. All right, so let's just do a few more.
So for this example here, I'm going to find my parent chain, but it's going to include that amine functional group because this whole thing has a special name. This is aniline. And then I have this nitro group on the end here. Since they're spaced on opposite sides of the ring, this would be para nitro aniline. For the last one here again, I'm going to find my parent chain. It's going to be this whole thing, my benzene ring plus that aldehyde functional group, my benzaldehyde. I got now these two, substitu two extra substituents coming off of it. This one's an ethyl group. What do I call the three carbon one? A propyl group. All right, so is this molecule ortho, beta, or para? Yeah, trick question, awesome, right? So now we got three things, we gotta use our numbering scheme. Ortho, meta, para, you can only use for two functional groups. It's telling you how far apart those two groups are on the benzene ring. If you got more than that, you're gonna have to number, okay? And importantly, if we're using one of our special benzene derivatives here, because that thing is part of the parent chain, this carbon automatically becomes carbon one. Okay, when you got that special group, an uh, alcohol group, the amine group, whatever it is, the thing that gives it its special name, that carbon that that group is on is carbon one. It's kind of nice, it limits your possibilities. Now we only got two here. I can go clockwise, one, two, three, four, five, or I can go counterclockwise, one, two, three, four, five, six. Which numbering scheme am I going to pick? Red or blue? Red. red, right. So red's got a one, a two, and a five. Blue's got a one, a three, and a six. So the red wins. Okay. Assemble my name in alphabetical order. So this would be two ethyl, five propyl, now we don't have to put the one for the benzaldehyde because again, it's assumed that that aldehyde group is on carbon one, right? Because it's that benzaldehyde parent chain. So it's just gonna be two ethyl five propyl benzaldehyde. All right, so these five, we just gotta know, flash card them. Um, again, they're not too bad. These ones down here are kind of the oddballs. Again, good thing to keep in mind is just aniline with the N of it in its name is the amine group, and a sol with the O in the name is the ether group. All right, so last two curveballs here. We have an exception to our ortho meta para rule. This molecule right here would not have the ortho meta para designation. You would use the numbering scheme. Okay? So if your benzene contains two non identical 
substituents use numbering instead of ortho meta para. I honestly don't know why. It would work just as well, but so that's that's just the convention. Okay. So but the caveat here being substituents, right? So up here my amine group was different from my nitro group. But that amine group wasn't a substituent, it was part of the parent chain. So those can be different, that's fine. But if they're both substituents, if they both go at the front of the name, then you have to use your numbering scheme. So everybody take a second using numbering, name this compound for me. So in this case, I have an ethyl group and I have a propyl group. I can number it from the ethyl to the propyl or vice versa. Which one of these numbering schemes am I going to use? Eth uh, red or blue? Red, right? So in this case, because they're going to be the same distance apart, I'm going to use my alphabetical order. So one ethyl, three propyl, benzene. So we have an exception to our ortho meta para rule. If we have two non-identical substituents, and again, substituents is a key word here, we're going to use our numbering instead of that ortho meta para scheme. Again, if it's not a substituent but part of the parent chain, like one of our special names here, then we can use that ortho meta para designation. Okay? So the last pain in the butt thing that we have to do, so these are what we're gonna call special benzene derivatives. And by that, I mean they have a special name, but they cannot be parent chains. So we're going to keep this group distinct from that other group of five, which we can have as parent chains built into our name. These are kind of standalone compounds that themselves are just really popular and have their own name. Okay? And they have to do with having methyl groups on your benzene ring. So if we have one methyl group on our benzene ring, what we call toluene, is the worst name of all of them. And if we have a dimethylbenzene, this also has a special name. Xylene, so it redeems itself with that cool one. All right, in this case, since these two methyl groups are one carbon removed, which xylene am I looking at here, ortho meta para? Meta. So this would be metaxylene. Okay. I want to keep these separate because again, if you start sticking other crap on the ring, you don't call it a toluene as a parent chain. These are just their own standalone compounds. They just have existed since before the IUPAC nomenclature scheme came along. So we let them keep their little common name because everybody used them. All right, but they're kind of in their own special little bin, distinct from our five up here, right? These are the five special ones that will become the parent chain in any molecule that contains those functional groups. 
All right. So we're going to end off here talking about sort of like the heart of this chapter, introducing it. We won't really get to be finished here. This concept of aromaticity. So, benzene here is a pretty special compound, all right, and it was especially fundamental in kind of establishing a lot of early principles in organic chemistry. It's kind of got this bizarre, yeah, like, okay, let me take a step back. What do we know about the bond length of double bonds versus single bonds? If we're going to rank A or B here, what should be longer? B, right? Even though it's between these two sp2 hybridized carbons, it's still a single bond. So we would expect for the bond length of B to be greater than the bond length of A. All right. So if I'm going to make like a really exaggerated structure of what they thought benzene would like look like, it has these really tiny double bonds. And then they're connected with these long single bonds. And this is a pretty ridiculously dramatic Oops. All right, but you would expect a benzene ring to look something like this. Alternate or you know, alter alternating short and long bonds. Well, one of the first sort of experiments that they were able to do back in the day with r relatively rudimentary technology was to establish that this thing was like ridiculously perfectly symmetric. This is absolutely not the case here, okay? And this sort of opened up this floodgates of what is now, we've already talked about a little bit, resonance, right? We talked about the perfect spacing of this double bond, single bond, double bond. What would we have called that last chapter? The conjugated, right? So this compound right here has this uh, ring of all these conjugated double bonds. All of these carbons here are sp2 hybridized. So they all have these p orbitals sticking up. And it turns out that these electrons, they don't just live stationary in every other p orbital they're constantly zipping themselves around this ring here, having full access to all of those p orbitals that are all lined up, all right? So if we were being really good with benzene here, we definitely wouldn't draw it like this. And if we were being really good, every time we drew benzene, we would also draw its other resonance contributor those double bonds have shifted. Yeah. And we hate that because it doesn't correctly keep track of how many electrons there are, but yes, that's why you'll see sometimes just the dotted circle in the middle. That's a pretty non-chemistry way to do it. So like biologists will do it like that. All right. So uh, to Ashton's question, does it matter where you put the double bonds? No, not at all, right? Because both of these structures are perfectly correct because those double bonds are constantly sort of spreading themselves out. And unlike some of the uh, resonance contributors that we talk about, it's not like one of these is more stable than the other. This is an exactly 50-50 mix of these two resonance contributors here, okay? All right, so first of all, what do we know about resonance and what that does to the stability of a structure? Does it lower the energy or raise the energy? Oh my God. All right, hold on. Let's talk about this. What does it mean to be stable? Low energy or high energy? Low energy. Low energy is good for, for chemistry. We always like small and low energy, right? So stable means low energy. All right, so yes. Resonance will have a stabilizing effect, will lower the energy of a structure, all right? And so we absolutely see that benzene, one of the anomalies 
is super stable. So, one sort of classic illustration of this, if we look at the energy that's released in a hydrogenation reaction, let's take a cyclohexene, just one double bond. If we mix that with hydrogen gas over a palladium catalyst, what are we going to get? Does anybody remember from the first semester? Yeah, right? So we're going to get an addition reaction to that double bond of those two hydrogens. And so out of that, we would just get cyclohexane. This process releases energy. <coughs> All right, so we're going to call this down here. This is our energy of cyclohexane. So this gap here, this is the energy that's released. We're going to put a second double bond in there. We're going to perform this same reaction. And we're forming that same product, that same cyclohexane. And so what we see is that twice as much energy gets released because we're reducing now two of those double bonds. Well, so that by that logic, if they take their benzene ring, which now has three double bonds, and we perform that same reaction, we would expect that the energy released, we would expect to be three times as much as with our original cyclohexene. That is not the case. Our benzene, we said, is super stable. So let's just think, does that mean that it actually releases more energy than predicted or less energy than predicted? Less, absolutely. So really, if I was to correctly place my benzene ring on this spectrum here, the actual amount of energy released is much less. It's about on par with a dye substitute. All right, so this was a, just a very simple calorimetry experiment which established very early on that there was something quite special about that benzene ring, something about having all those double bonds spaced the way that they were.
And we kind of already know the punchline of what they got at, this theory of double bonds being conjugated, because that's what we studied last chapter. But it was really benzene that introduced that into the organic chemistry world. All right? OK, cool. But I didn't just call this compound conjugated. I gave it this special name here, aromatic. All right? So this is now like the next level of super duper stability that you can get. It's like conjugated on steroids. All right? So aromatic rings. And this is going to be a big part of this chapter, is given a structure. Can you tell me whether or not it's aromatic? There are two features that you have to have in order to be aromatic. Let's just put benzene down so we can convince ourselves that it is indeed aromatic. Okay. So first of all, you got to be a ring. You have to have a ring of fully conjugated double bonds. All right, and let's just make note that this implies all sp2 hybridized carbons. Uh, let's just say sp2 hybridized because we're going to see something else here. All right. So when I'm given a structure like this, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go around my ring and I'm going to make sure that indeed everything is sp2 hybridized. Okay. Meaning that it has a double bond associated with it. And if we look, I color these all in here. All of these carbons are sp2 hybridized, right? So this is now a fully conjugated ring. All right, but it turns out that there's another important feature. You need an odd number of delocalized electron pairs. All right, so in benzene, it's these three pi bonds that are delocalized. So first thing I'm going to do is make sure my compound follows rule of one, go through and color all my sp2 hybridized carbons, make sure they form a ring, and then I'm going to go back and count one, two, three, okay, check, check, follows rule two as well. You have to have an odd number of delocalized electron pairs in that ring. If your compound satisfies both of these rules right here, it is an aromatic compound. If it violates rule one, We call these non-aromatic compounds. And if it violates rule two, we call these anti-aromatic compounds. So here's the name of the game. We're going to look at a structure. We're going to look at a molecule. And we're going to apply these two rules here. And from there, we'll be able to determine whether this compound's aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic. Right? It either satisfies rule one and two, 
it violates rule one or it violates rule two. All right. So I'm going to put down some compounds and we're going to go through and determine whether they're aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic.
All right, so let's go through. We're gonna apply our rules here. Do we have a fully conjugated ring? Are all those atoms in my ring sp2 hybridized? So I'm gonna go through in color. These carbons have that double bond on either side. So we got sp2 hybridization. These ones are sp2 hybridized. And what about the one up top? Is it sp2? No, what is it? SP3. And so just like when we were talking about isolated versus conjugated double bonds, this one does not have that P orbital, and so it disrupts the conjugation of this ring. And since this compound violated rule one, we would call it non-aromatic. All right. Now, you may be like, oh, well, it also violates rule two. Rule one is rule one for a reason. If it doesn't meet rule one, we're done. It's not aromatic. Okay? All right, for this one here, we got this big ugly thing. We're just going to apply our same two rules here. We're going to go through and mark all of our sp2 hybridized carbons. Everything that has a double bond associated with it. Boom. So these ones are pretty easy to see. What about this guy in the middle here? Is this sp2 hybridized? Yeah, sure is. Okay, it's got one, one, two, three bonding regions here. So this is also sp2 hybridized. Same down here. All right. To be clear, you could have drawn this structure with the double bond over here as well, right? You just got to pick one position for it. But I d indeed have this full network, this full ring of sp2 hybridized carbons. So this one does not violate rule one. So now I'm going to move on to rule two here. How many pairs of delocalized electrons do we have in this structure? One, two, three four, five. So does this violate rule two? No. This is an odd number. Five pairs of electrons. So this compound is indeed aromatic. All right, let's look at our square here. Are uh, cyclobutadiene. Do I have a full network of conjugated pi bonds, a, a conjugated ring here? This one's sp2, this one's sp2, 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 boom. All right. Does this one violate rule two? Now I have an even number of pairs of electrons. So this one is anti-aromatic. All right, it's freaking impossible to draw seven membered rings here. It looks a little crooked, best I can do, all right? Okay. Let's go through and figure out if this violates rule one. I'm going to mark all carbons about a double bond. And then I get to this top one, bam, messes it all up, all right? I have this sp3 hybridized carbon in my ring messing up my conjugation. And again, if it violates rule one, you're just going to stop and say this is non-aromatic. So this is another example of a non aromatic compound. For our last two examples here, we have these carbocations in our ring. So how the heck are we supposed to deal with that? All right. I'm going to go through and I'm going to mark all of my sp2 hybridized carbons, everything about this double bond. What about the, that carbocation? Do I get to mark that one? A carbocation. We said has three bonds. And how many lone pairs? 
zero lone pairs, right? So those three bonding regions makes this sp2 hybridized. Remember, one of the things that makes a carbocation so good at accepting electrons is it has this incomplete octet, so it's got this empty orbital, and that empty orbital is a p orbital. So in my compound here, I have all of these bonding p orbitals, all right, about either side of my double bond, and they're filled with these electrons. But my carbocation is not going to mess up that conjugation because it's sitting here with this empty p orbital ready to accept any pair of electrons, right? So we still have this fully conjugated ring where all of my carbons in that ring are sp2 hybridized, all right? So let's just make a note. For rule one, we said we had to have a ring of sp2 hybridized atoms. We can just remind ourselves that carbocations are sp2. They have an empty p orbital. All right, so with that in mind, I want you guys to finish off these last two structures for me. Tell me whether it's non-aromatic, anti-aromatic, or aromatic. What about this first one here? Aromatic or non-aromatic? Or anti-aromatic? So this one would be aromatic. We established it doesn't violate rule one. We got that full network in our ring. And now I'm going to count my pairs of electrons. Notice that there is no pair of electrons associated with the carbocation. So it doesn't mess up my ring conjugation, but it also isn't going to contribute towards my total here. So this is an odd number of pairs of electrons. So this would be an aromatic compound. All right. And what about this compound here? Does this violate rule one? No. As we established, all of these, including that carbocation, would be sp2 hybridized. And what about rule two? It does violate rule two, because I have two pairs of delocalized electrons, so this compound here would be anti-aromatic. Okay, so we have this uh, set of rules for what makes a compound aromatic. It's gotta have a fully conjugated ring, and it has to have an odd number of electron pairs, okay? Kind of as the name implies, well, aromatic, super stable, non-aromatic, nothing special, but anti-aromatic, all right, and this is what I mean as the name implies, these are unexpectedly unstable. Right, so aromatic's good, non-aromatic meh, anti-aromatic's bad. It actually increases the energy of a compound more than what you would expect. If we go back to our rules here, remember it's anti-aromatic if it has 
an even number of delocalized electron pairs, right? Why? Like, where did rule two come from? I don't know. Rule one kind of makes sense. There's got to be a place for those electrons to move in a circle. Okay, fine. I get that. This, like, odd number of electron pairs business, like, where the hell did that come from, right? And all of a sudden, having an even number is super bad. Like, what the heck's going on there, all right? So that's what we'll pick up with next time is discussing this, like, molecular orbital theory that helps explain why anti-aromatic is so bad and aromatic is so good, okay? Right now, we should be able to at least look at a compound and establish whether or not it's aromatic, non-aromatic, or anti-aromatic.